come behold the works of God, the nations are his feet. Welcome to the teaching ministry of Calvary Chapel Corinth with Senior Pastor Charlie Villard. We're an expositional teaching church with a mission to comfort those in any affliction with the comfort in which we ourselves have been comforted by God. We're glad to have you join us today, so let's open up our Bibles and begin our verse-by-verse study in God's Word. Matthew chapter 18. Let's read. It's going to be an interesting one. I'm going to kind of wanted to get through 18 and 19, but we'll see. Verse 1. At the time, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. Whoever causes one of these little ones to, who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses. For offenses must come, but woe to that man by whom the offense comes. If your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life lame or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven their angels always see my face or see the face of my father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine to go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? And if he should find it, assuredly, I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the ninety-nine that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear you, take with you one or two more than by th- that by mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear him, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like the, bre- like the heathen and the tax collectors. Surely I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For there are two or three, where there are two or three gathered in my name, I am there in the midst of them. And Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded, and he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and that the payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me. I will pay you all. Then the master of the servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. But he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he called to him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you begged me. Should you not also have given, shown compassion to your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him into the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly Father also will do to each of you from his heart. Does, for, so my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Well, let's see how far we get. 
So we've, we're continuing on this, this conversation, right? And last week in 17, um, we ended with um, Peter having, this thing, Peter having a, a conversation with the Lord about um, paying taxes, right? And the Lord's like, well, look, you know, who, where do these taxes come from? Who are these owed to? And he sent him out and he said, hey, go out fishing, cast your line in, pull out the fish, take the coin that's in the mouth that you'll find, which is a miracle unto itself. And then, you know, and go and pay for us. So his disciples are, have these sort of conversations, right? And, and sometimes it'll mention that they've had conversations amongst themselves. And other times, you know, it'll say that the Lord heard them talking. Clearly, when they come and ask this question, they've been having some sort of argument about who's the greatest of all and who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And it's an ongoing thing that's, that's happened here. So he, in, in verse 1, we have, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And all the questions you could ask the Lord during his time on this earth, that was the burning question that they had. Who's going to be the greatest? I have to point out that when the Lord starts to answer this question, he does not say Peter, the first pope, who would have been the greatest man on this earth. As I said, a you know, we'll have to point out things as they come along. It's not Peter. It says, Then Jesus called a little child to him and set him in the midst of them. And he said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So he starts off, I'm not even going to tell you who the greatest is. I'm going to tell you, if you aren't converted, you're not even going to be in the kingdom of heaven to begin with. And I, I, I'm... <laughs> I'm not sure who, if he's speaking at this point to someone directly, because we have Judas in the midst of them, right, who's going to betray him, who could have, he's given him an option, right? If you want to be in the kingdom of heaven, what do you have to do? You have to be converted and be like a child. Judas knew the things that it would take to be saved. He refused and committed suicide and, you know, and, and died and, and is in hell. I mean, there's this, there's the Judas gospel, Right? There's this document that floats around was Judas's accounting of things. It's been proven that it's false. It's not from this time. It's not from Judas. Judas was unrepentant and unregenerated, and he was never going to be changed by that because he chose not to. But he says, first of all, you need to be converted to become and become as little children. He says, and for there who, therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. Now, it's an interesting thing. I, not all children are humble. I mean, right, they can be arrogant and prideful and they will be rude and they want to do things on their own. But if you think about it, before that sort of sinful attitude sets in, little children are kind of humble. Humble in the sense of they're meek. They know they have needs. They come to you and say, I'm hungry. I'm thirsty, right? They, they don't. They don't think about, um, I'll just do this on my own, right, until they get to that certain age. But what they have to do is ask for things from someone. So in humility, they say, I'm hungry, you know, I want some food, or I want to, can I get a drink, or I have a boo-boo, right? They skin their knee and they come crying to you. That's, that's humility, right? Pride sets in eventually, you're like, I don't need anyone's help. I'm going to do this on my own. They're walking around, their knees bleeding everywhere, and it's all over the clothes. And you're like, what, what happened? And you're like, nothing. Nothing happened. I'm fine right so it's this this what the lord's talking about is this humility that a child naturally has that as they grow they lose that we don't want people's help we're self-made people we do our own thing it's impossible for someone with that attitude to walk to the kingdom of heaven because there's order in heaven there's hierarchy there's um authority right you don't just do whatever you want we answer to the king well, i don't do whatever i want i answer to a king so he says, if you can humble yourselves, that's how you become like a little child, like this little child. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. He makes a cool point, right? Receive a child in the name of the Lord. Treat them as the Lord would treat us and not hurt them, not use them, not exploit them. I'm, I'll try not to go way off on that one. In verse 6, whoever causes one of these little ones to, who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Okay, I can already feel it welling up. I'm probably going to go off on this. Should 
children have an innocence to them. And not like I, I'm look up we we're gonna read in Thursday nights in Genesis chapter three, right? That every every sin is entered into man and is born into every child. You know, every child, every one of you that was a kid that had a father, because that's why you're here, you had to have a biological male and a biological female make a kid, right? It's pretty obvious. Sin is passed on from the father, right? That was Adam's, that was God's conversation with Adam. As you have kids, sin will be passed on from the father. So the women, you're innocent. You don't pass on sin. It's the man's fault. It's your dad's fault. That's it, right? It's my dad's fault. But even being born that way, right? Like I had this picture that, Every kid is born a blank slate. Nothing, right? Just at base, ground zero, they're all just good. And then things happen that change them. And the fact is, biblically, that's inaccurate. It's a lie. They're all born sinful and to different degrees. And, you know, people that have, you know, I talk with like some of the families out at Orrington because like seven or more kids have their own football teams. It's pretty common. You know, like, oh, are your kids the same? Like, no way. Every kid's different. I have a kid that never talks back, a kid that talks back all the time, a kid that rarely talks back, and a kid that's motivated, a kid that's not motivated, right? But God makes them, right? He creates them. He forms them. And sin twists it all up. So you never really know what you're going to get. So, you know, as I was thinking through life, I was like, all right, well, if we're all born sinful, but kids are still sort of innocent, right? They don't understand the ways of the world. They don't see how things work. They don't know what trouble faces them. That's why they have parents, and that's why we try to impart to them, pay attention to these things or watch for those. Don't take candy from strangers. Stay away from people with weird large vans with no windows all over them except for in the front, right? And that's still a weird thing. But then stuff happens. People make mistakes, right? Or people choose to do things to kids. And it affects their innocence. It takes away something that God put within them. A purity, um, a, a trust that they have with people. And I, I, I say this because this is what happened to me. I was a young kid, introduced to pornography, and then I was molested. And it messes up your brain. It warps everything you, you think. Shame sets in and pain and, and anger. So kids aren't born innocent. They're born sinful. It's part of the fall of man. But there is an innocence that the Lord's talking about here. That you take advantage of someone who doesn't know better. The Lord has a special place for them in hell. I do believe that. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin. I remember being that age and, and thinking about the things of God, right? God, my dad would, you know, explain, try to explain things of God, right? Growing up as a Catholic, you'd, limited understanding. You don't read your Bible, right? You don't ask questions. You just you do what's told, right? That, it's part of their church tradition. But he would try to explain those things, right? There's a God, there's something bigger out there from, you know, you. And he, and he speaks, he speaks biblical principles. He's used it in his whole life and how he treats other people and how he does things at work. Doesn't make, make mistakes, he does. But that's what he taught me. And I can remember at a young age, we went to Florida, we went to Disney. And it was like, I think it was like April, because it was like, it was still snowing. We left to Bangor Airport, right? And we, when we were flying, I was like, are we going to see God? in the clouds and he's like no nah, i don't i don't really think that's how that works and it's like well yeah but if god's real and god's in the sky then why wouldn't i see him where i mean we're clearly as high as possible i can remember as god's brought it to my memory i didn't think about it for years and years and years but i remember going god who are you like if, if you really want to like me to know you like how do i get to know you what do i do and then people take away an innocence you don't think about that stuff anymore you start thinking, man, I should hide this because the person that's doing this would be in trouble and I'm, they're supposed to love me. They're supposed to care about me. Or, you know, you want to fit in with a group of people and then this continues on and on and on and it becomes like, well, this must be normal. But it's not normal. You know it. You're, you know it deep in your heart and you hide it 
And then I made decisions for the rest of my life to warp my brain with pornography and to mess my whole life up. I can't undo those things. I also understand now looking back at it historically, what was done to me was done to that person. And whoever did that to them was done to that person. They continued passing along this and excusing it. Excusing it as, oh, it's just kids, right? Just kids. They're just being normal. They're just doing things. No, it's not normal. It is not. It is sin. And the Lord says, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. So let's, re let's work in reverse. How deep is the ocean? Do we know? I mean, we have ideas now, right? We have things that can go down. We have equipment. We have submarines. The Marianas Trench uh, in Monterey. Is that, is that the one? I'm pretty sure it's the one. That's things, I mean, giant. We lived out near Monterey for years, and we go to the aquarium or, you know, go down to the coast. And, you know, to think about it, fathom that as the highest mountain is on this earth, below the water line in the ocean is that deep too. What's down there? It's pitch black. You can't even see stuff, right? And you, you actually go to the aquarium, and they have this cool um, exhibit where you walk into a pitch black room, and they have, like, black lights, and the lights that, well, they're not like black lights. It's like a little light. But what the room is lit up by are the things that live so far down there is no light that they generate their own light. It's the coolest thing, right? You're looking at these fish and you're like, man, they're, just like, they're so cool. They make their own light in the water because they had nothing, right? They've adapted to those conditions. 2,000 years ago, there was no equipment to tell how deep the ocean was. They believed it was endless, Right? That there was no bottom. They didn't know how, they didn't know what was in there. There was no way to tell. They knew if you fell in there and you weren't able to swim, you're drowning and you're dying. So at this time, it says the depth of the sea, but it's, it's unknown how deep the sea is. And this millstone now, if we come back to that, this is this giant thing that big donkeys, work horses carried, right? And you'd hook it onto their neck and they would carry it, these beasts of burden. You wouldn't be able to pick this thing up. You definitely wouldn't be able to swim, and you certainly wouldn't be treading water on it. And he's saying, if you cause one of these little ones to sin, it would be better for you in the end for you to put that thing on your neck and jump straight into the ocean and die. What's that? I mean, we know what that means, right? That means hell. Right? Because if you die without Christ in that time, without being, you know, following the law and without God, then you're going to hell. Which also leads me to that must mean there's something else in hell. It's not just an equal thing. That God has something there. It's not, you know, maybe one guy never causes a kid to sin, just spends his whole life not knowing God goes to hell, and there's a certain place, you know, and level of punishment for him. But there's something else for people that do these things to kids. It's a stern warning as he's saying these. You know, I, I can't even imagine the disciples have been like hearing this going, whoa, whoa, whoa. I was just wondering who was going to be the greatest in heaven. You could say no one and I would have been fine. But you've now gone sort of this direction where it's real depressing. But it's a stark warning to the Lord. He says, and it's back in Exodus, um, I'm pretty sure. But he talks about the law. He talks about orphans and widows. The two most vulnerable groups of people in our world, right? The widow who's lost her husband and has no one to take care of her, easily taken advantage of. The child who has no parents, has no one to take care of them around, easily taken advantage of. Sometimes, unfortunately, it's the parents that do these things. Sometimes it's family members, sometimes it's friends. It doesn't matter how sorry you really are, right? If you're, what do you go back to the beginning? If you are not converted and become like little children, it's a nice, dark, rainy day to be talking about this one. Woe in seven to the world because of offenses. He says, whoa, because of offenses that happen. Right? Woe to the world. Be aware of these things. But for offenses must come, but woe to that man by whom the offense comes. Right? Stuff happened to me. It happened to all of you. We know it, right? And you, you've made choices because of it. Some good, some bad. We regret a lot. I regret a lot of things, right? My, my brain is jacked up. It's not this, it'll never be the way that it was. It'll, I spend m 
massive amounts of time praying to the Lord for him to rewire the way that I think, the way that I do things, how I see the world. You know, I'll, I'll explain it. So when a kid's introduced to pornography at a very young age, and this will go for pornography, for video games, for TV, for things, anything that excites the brain, right? They're young, their brain's wiring. The brain is an awesome thing. It's the only organ in your body made out of plastic. You, it's this neuroplasmic material that can expand, it can grow, it can reshape itself, it can grow back. Um, no other organs really do that. Your, your, your liver can grow back to some extent, right? It gets to a certain point. But God's made the brain this, this, it's genius, right? And it's not evolution, it's genius. It's architected, it's designed to build these pathways of how you think, right? And then you see a kid, you don't lie, you tell the truth. Even if you get into trouble, you still tell the truth, right? And then you see them work through it and go, oh, okay. You know, or the reward system that we use, right? If you get up off the floor in the middle of this grocery store and stop screaming and crying because I'm really embarrassed, I'll take you and we'll get a toy. Okay, 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 I'll do it. You actually rewired their brain in that very instant. You said, if you do this, you will be rewarded. There's nothing wrong with the reward system. This book's full of it. We talked about this a lot yesterday. God rewards for good works. It's okay, right? But the greatest reward is love and sacrifice for another to do things, right? You do it because I've asked you to and you respect me and you love me, right? As a parent, that's why I need you to do it. But we use the reward system, right? You know, if you get up off the floor and stop crying, you can watch the iPad for 20 minutes. So as your brain's rewiring, it starts to think a certain way. And it's really hard to undo that pattern. It takes a long time because you have to undo the way that these neurotransmitters have been wired. Right? And so there's a few chemicals in your brain. I'm going to screw all the names up. Dopamine, right? That's the high one. So when I see pornography or when somebody shoots a needle in their arm or when they drink alcohol, or when you win at a get slot machine, right? When you're gambling. Or um, actually for me, I get a dopamine rush when I see the sun is out and I look out and I see blue sky and green grass. It's like a dopamine rush for me. I, I don't know what it does. It's probably why I wanted to live in California so long. Unfortunately, it's not always green grass. You know, like most of the year, the grass is dead and it's brown. But your brain, when you see something like this and all this dopamine rushes, it goes, whoa, 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 whoa. That's too much. You, you got to hang back, right? You cannot live this way. So your brain shuts down these dopamine receptors. So the next time you see it, it doesn't do exactly the same thing. This is why a drug addict or an addict in general, I won't even go a drug addict, right? An addict in general does something deeper or more the next time. Instead, I got to get high twice or I got to watch four hours of pornography or whatever, right? Whatever it, whatever it is. Because your brain doesn't react the same way. And it keeps going and going and going and going. To the point where you run into like dopamine fatigue. Sorry, something in my eye. You run into like a dopamine fatigue where your body doesn't react anymore. You don't get excited as you did. Uh, there was a Toyota commercial um, almost years ago. And it was like this guy's life is just so boring. He, they, they, he said he had adrenaline fatigue nothing excited him and like he was like i don't know he, it, the funny thing was he like goes and he picks up his paper and like a dog comes running at him and is barking right in his face and he's just like you know and he walks off and then he sees the toyota and he's like oh that's it i'm excited about life now I'm like it's it's a thing right you just you start to not be as excited about life so dopamine Heroin's a drug, but heroin doesn't get you excited. Dopamine does. Heroin triggers dopamine to release. You have serotonin, which is the leveling chemical, right? It's the, you, nor, normally what you'd find is, is norepinephrine and serotonin are chemicals that antidepressants have, right? They try to level you off so you're not too up and too down. It's supposed to level you so you're not manic. And, oh, I feel awesome right now, and now I feel really terrible. And then I feel awesome, and I feel really terrible pretty much a standard woman's life I think isn't it the up and down that's and guys were just like whatever 
So we're, since we were married, we've been like beat down. So we're just like, whatever. No, just, just kidding. Um, and then you have, uh, this is the one I'm always going to forget. Uh, mothers, when you breastfeed, this is released. Uh, what is it? Oxytocin. Thank you. Yes. Oxytocin. Oxytocin is a bonding drug in your body. And these are all things in your body that God produced. You didn't evolve with them. God made them and he made them for a purpose. When women breastfeed their child, oxytocin is released. It makes you love your child. When you actually have skin on skin contact with someone, it, it releases oxytocin, right? So it bonds you and it makes you fall in love with this person. These chemicals are occurring. So now take that and, and, and think about addiction. Those things are all being released when it comes to the weight of addiction. You watch pornography and dopamine rushes and you're like, wow, this is exciting, but I still feel like this is wrong, right? There's something in you telling you this is not right. It's God's law built into you. Don't do this. It's not what you should be seeing as a young child. And then other drugs, serotonin and norepinephrine start to go kind of crazy and oxytocin starts to get released as how do I explain this one? In sex, you have an ultimate peak, correct? Right? A whole batch of those drugs get released even when you're watching pornography and you're masturbating or you're having sex with someone. All of that happens. You start to love them. This is why it's important with women and men. Women, it releases on such a huge level and it bonds them during the sexual act. But this stuff can happen when you're watching pornography or when you're doing drugs, right? The oxytocin still gets released. It messes you up. But then you start to love what it is, is the object of your addiction. I start to love pornography. And what happens when you love something? Anything that's opposite or, or, or comes to take that away, you hate them. Well, love and hate is a reality in this world. There's never going to be a world with no hate. Because God even said it, you either love me or you hate me. He only gave us two choices. When someone comes to hurt your child, you're going to protect them, right? You're going to do it with the worst hatred in the world because they're looking to take away something you love. Hatred is natural. It's natural. We shouldn't just hate every random person, right? I hate someone with a weird accent or I hate this person because they drive terrible, right? I mean, th th we've messed that up. But what happens in addiction is, is the people that try to help you, what are they? They're trying to tear you away from your addiction and you begin to hate them, which is why people that are around addicts go, I don't understand, I love you. And they don't get that, no. You're trying to take them away from something that they're bonded to and they love, they hate you. And it's not personal. It's not like I hate you more, I hate anyone that wants to take me away from that. That's what happened in my whole life. I live in shame and in secret. And when I was growing up, it was a little different. You had to go to the store to get pornography. You had to get a magazine that was wrapped in plastic. I didn't have to just pull out my phone and type on Google. I couldn't even do that. But then the world of the internet came around and I was like, whoa, what is this? I don't have to pay for pornography, it's free. I started sharing it and downloading it. And then I started getting into programming. And look, the byproduct was, I've had a great career as a computer programmer. God has blessed me. He blessed me with a brain to see how things work. When we have problems, I can work it out in my head before I ever go look at anything. And I'm like, I go look over there, that's this, and then this is what's happening. I bet that's, I bet that's it. If I was more arrogant, I'd be like, that is absolutely it. Don't even tell me that it's not. Go get it. Right? I always leave open. I might be wrong, but it's probably that. And they'll come back and it was that. And I was like, <clears throat> yep, I know. And it's like, oh God, please, I'm so sorry. It was, it was you. God's the greatest programmer in the world. I've struggled my whole life with this. And I've been with Sheena since I was 16. When we were at a young age when she found some and I tried to lie and tried to get out of it, I still carried this, this pain and shame, right? I never told her to begin with what started it. It wasn't even until I got saved in my 30s of the first person I ever mentioned it to was her, right? And I might have over the years made allude, you know, alluded to it or said things, but then I just sort of laid it out. I, this is what happened. I'd like to go, it's not my fault. But it is because I chose to do these things on a continual basis. 
but it, I didn't look for it. I didn't try to get it. I wouldn't even have known about it unless someone had introduced it to me. There's way more to the story, but something I would never say on camera. I'll say most things, but I'll tell you one day. Um, anyway, that whole thing, because me, I lost my innocence. I wasn't asking for it. I wasn't even looking for it. And today I still deal with it. I can't understand when my brain is so warped and so rewired to the point where when I look at a person, I don't see a person. I don't see a human being. I don't see God's creation. I see a catalog of body parts. That's what pornography is, does to men and women. And it's not a man problem. This is a men and women problem. And even more so why it's grown is because boys live in their basement and watch pornography all day. And then women are left to go, well, what am I supposed to do in life, right? I have desires. I want to do things. And women get sucked into it too. 75% of men in and out of the church use pornography on a daily basis. That is the, st the statistic for men. 55% of women. So one in two women. It's terrible. It's terrible. And you can't really see it. Y you know, it's not, it's something once you've noticed it, you're too far gone. Right? These guys that do stuff to kids or women, right? Ted Bundy. The guy's a sick, twisted freak. And he, he talks about his life, being introduced to pornography, and then it got violent. There's so, it's, pornography is not, when you go look, it is not just two people having sex. It is messed up. And the worst part about drug addiction and alcohol and and you know pornography is you have to look at different stuff every time it just gets worse and worse right the guy that molests kids i'm not excusing it don't get me wrong that he didn't start there he started by someone doing that to him and then continued on he has consequences to it he deserves to answer for it but at the end of the day, if all of us have sinned and all have fallen short, there's a level playing field to a certain extent. But the Lord points out here that it's not equal to the ones that hurt kids. People that did that to me, they will answer for it. They will. And honestly, it doesn't even comfort me. And not because I'm angry, but because I would have rather them got saved. If they got saved, they would have knew that they did wrong. They would have spent their life changing that, speaking out against it. I actually wish they would have got saved. They did not, I can tell you that. So these things will happen. And he says, woe to the offense of the man who causes it. And this is a man and woman. It doesn't, this is not just men. Man is generalized here. In aid, if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life lame or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. I read this early on as a Christian and I was like, okay, I need to pluck my eyes out and cut my hands off because I have access to a computer and I have eyes. All right? Because he goes on in 9 to say, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It's better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two to be cast into the hellfire. He's not really literally talking about cutting off body parts. It's a metaphor, right? Because if I cut off my hands and I cut, pluck out my eyes, what did I, just be, what did I just explain for 10 minutes? My brain is so warped. I don't forget things. I wish I could forget all kinds of things because I can't remember things I should. I don't have any room anymore, right? It's all filled with junk that I'm trying to as, as the gospel says, to renew your mind, right? That's the time I spend with the Lord, renewing it. There are things I never think about anymore. I'm so thankful, right? I don't, I don't think about those days, the things that happened, but I have a battle that I still wage every single minute of every single day because what my flesh desires, what my brain wants, my heart doesn't want those. It's like the, the heart's you know, willing, but the flesh is weak. So you gotta keep that in subjection. So he's not saying cut these things off, cut your hands off, cut your eyes out. He's saying, do what it is that you need to do to make sure that life circumstances don't drag you into that. I'm a computer guy. I probably should have quit the computer industry a long time ago. 
and I should have just done something else that took me away from computers because that's my problem, right? Electronics. So what do I do in the meantime? My phone gets filtered. My devices get filtered. I have men that I'm accountable to, right? That, so I don't find myself in those places. But at the end of the day, my, I, I can still sin here, right? I, still, I can still think about things. I can still picture things. But he's saying, though, if you need to do these things, do them. It would be better for you to make a change knowing that, admitting to it, like, look, I can't, I can't do that. I can't watch that movie or I can't watch that. You know, we don't, can't watch a nudity. I can watch the violent of movies. I love the John Wick series. It doesn't bother me, right? It doesn't affect me. And it's fake, right? It's fake violence. It's probably not the best thing. And I do not recommend you watch John Wick. If you do, come and watch it, though. Come and talk to me so we can talk about how awesome John Wick is. Nudity I, it's not fake, right? A naked woman's body is a naked woman's body. Once I see it, I've seen it. That's the problem. You can't fake that. Violence is fake. I know it. Horror movies, well, all those things, I know all those are, they don't, it's not how it affects me. What I do find is that if I don't stay on the purity path of trying to think, watch things that don't drag me, those things will drag me eventually. For instance, you know, one of the questions I get a lot um, when I teach the guys at CRD, you know, young guys will be like, hey, can I do this when I leave? I don't know. Should you do that is the question. Well, can I, can I listen to this? I don't know. Should you listen to that? You know, and then we had this conversation one time. I'm sure, Paul, you'll, you'll, you know, these guys, they'll be like, well, can I go listen to Metallica? There's nothing wrong with listening to Metallica. I'm like, I don't know. I mean, I listen to Metallica still. However, Metallica is not a draw for me into something else. If what you're talking about draws you back into a place where you were living that you're trying to recreate, forsake it all. It's not worth it. Burn it all. Throw it all away. Because five or ten minutes of listening to that that drags you back into sin and away from God, that's what he's talking about, right? Toss it out. It's not, it's not worth it. That listening to Metallica is not my problem. Right? I have other things that are issues. Gaming for me is a difficult one. I can't really do that anymore. Because hours of gaming on my own leads me to think about I'm on my own. Leads me to think about what I could do while I'm on my own. Being home alone is not really a great thing for me. Right? Not working is not a great thing for me. There are things I should be doing that I should continually do so that I don't find myself in places or lead, being led into places. Because what he said here I'll say it like this. It scares the living hell out of me. Quite literally. I do not want to end up in a place like that because I got yanked back by my own flesh. I should have should have should have quit the computing world. Cuz it's 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 trouble, right? But work was never my issue. Um, you know, I we we filter at work. I get to I'm in control of those things now because I get to answer for that, right? I'm the director of technology. Hey, should we have this? Yeah, we should absolutely ban this. We should have, we should filter this out. I had a friend, well, not really a friend, but a guy I worked with multiple times watching pornography during work, ended up getting fired. Just couldn't stay away long enough. 10, take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my father who is in heaven. Guardian angels, right? This subject of guardian angels. This is one. I believe we have angels, right? I believe we also have a demon of some sort that follows us around and tempts us constantly. And they know us so well, which is why they continue to tempt us with the same things. And then we fall to them. And they go, yep, that one worked again. Like, man, every time you want to ha you have a certain thought, try this. Um, you know, hey, look, this is something that leads me into sin. Start reading your Bible when you're about to do that or start praying. The enemy will change his tactic because he doesn't want you reading the Bible with praying during that. He's going to go, okay, well, let's, let's change this up a little bit. Let's, we'll catch you somewhere where we'll catch you off guard, right? If we stay in this and we continue to meditate on his word, we continue to fill our heads and our lives with worship music and things like that, right? It, it's not going to fix everything. What it's going to do is eliminate places where we can make compromise. Guardian angels. <laughs> It, we we joke about this because Pastor Ken does like really crazy things and always ends up in really crazy like weird situations. He'll tell you about trees that fall or chainsaw accidents that he probably has like 80 guardian angels that are constantly trying to manage circumstances. 
I do believe that, right? I mean, he says it here. That, and do not despise them. Do not despise kids. It's hard, right? Because you're you look at your kid and you're like, I don't know where you came from. Why are you acting like this? This is clearly not me. This is definitely your father. But he says in 11, for the son of man has come to save that which was lost. The, move, the, the, the moment he said this, I don't, I don't know how the disciples weren't like, oh man, yes, you're right, you're right. Because he had this, this child conversation multiple times with the disciples because they were like, get away, get away, kids. You're just annoying. You should be seen and not heard. Right, it's, there's merit to having a child that doesn't interrupt and that you know knows when to ask a question and when not to, right? It's something you're trying to teach them because it's part of having respectful relationships. Why have a kid if you hate the kid? Right? Sometimes people hate their kid because they didn't want to have a kid and then they had a kid. Well, really, you should hate the guy that got you pregnant and hate yourself for allowing the guy to get you pregnant, not the kid. It's not the kid's fault. Kids are frustrating too, right? You're, you're frustrating. You're not really, but you, know. Kid, you guys are, right? And, and kids, aren't parents frustrating? No, never, right, no. I, of course parents are frustrating. It's part of life, right? It's the dynamic that God has made in that, that whole family relationship, which is why we have to be rooted somewhere, right? At the end of the day, knowing like, look, God loves me. God loves you. He's created us. This is not us, right? Sin has entered the world, and this is what we're trying to rid the world of by having a relationship with Christ, keeping the right perspective, he says, 12, what do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the 99 and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? I mean, I guess he would if it's not the Sabbath, right? That's what the Pharisees would be like. What's the Sabbath? You can't go work. You're not gonna be able to lift your sheep up. You gotta keep the law. No way. His sheep is important to him. And if you should find it, assuredly I say to you that he rejoices more over that sheep than the 99 that did not go astray. Why? Why would he rejoice over that one even more? Because he found it. What was lost was now found. It's exciting, right? You know, we're running around looking for your keys when you got to leave and you finally find them. Isn't that a relief? Isn't it exciting? Isn't it like, I've never wanted to see that set of keys more than this very moment. And I hate the set of keys that I always lose it, but I'm excited to see it, right? Because you think when you've lost this, you're, you start to grieve, panic sets in. These, these shepherds love their sheep. They spent their lives with them. It's their prized possessions. It's why sacrificing one for the law was very difficult, right? Can you imagine you take this prized sheep and in order for sin to be um, removed and, you know, um, for the remission of sin, they take this prized sheep. What would they do? They'd bring it to the, to the priest. The priest would lay it up on there and they'd set their forehead on the forehead of the sheep. Imagine setting your forehead to pass sin, your sin onto that thing that never did a thing. I can't even imagine it. I do that with my dogs sometimes. They set my forehead on their forehead and I hold them. I can't imagine then going, go ahead and slit its throat and bleed it out because it's the only way that I won't have any sin. I wouldn't want to sin. And then I'd have this propensity built inside me to do sin and then I'd have to go back and do it again and do it again. I don't understand how these people weren't crying out going, please God, send me a savior so I can stop doing just that. How? How would they not? And here is the Lord going, I'm the one that came to do this. I'm the one that will redeem them. 14, even so, it is not the will of your father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. God's will for every human being, every one of us, is that we would come to know who he is and we would spend a life in eternity with him. Hell wasn't made for us. It's not how it was built, right? It was built to hold the enemy. Before the foundations of the earth, the angels were made, Lucifer took a third, and then they fell. And God had a plan for them. Eventually, there'll come a time and they will be cast into that pit and they'll be done. And I will spend my life in eternity with the Lord, fellowshipping with him and all that he made good for me. That is God's will. Not that he would stop you from drinking or stop you from doing this or he's, if I go to church, then I'm going to be convicted and the guy that I'm living with who's not my husband, then I, I won't want to marry. Those are, those are ridiculous reasons to not know God. 
Because if God has that for you and wants that for your life, you're gonna go to church and then you're gonna go, let's get married. He's gonna go, yes, you're absolutely right. Let's honor God and I love you and I wanna commit to you. I want to show you that I love you. We talked about it a couple weeks ago when I started to go off. Men should show you that they love you. They should seek after you. They should chase you down and, and build a life to show you how much they want to spend that life with you. Not say, let's have sex. And then when he's done his act of sex and moves on and doesn't really think about you anymore, then you're like, oh, I don't really feel loved anymore. You know, I really would love to have a home together. Okay, as long as we can keep having sex, let's buy a home together. And then you buy the home together and you're like, well, I don't, still don't really feel like we're committed. Hey, I'll, whatever you need. Just as long as we keep having sex. Stop having sex with someone you're not married to. See how long they last. Test it. No one does because they know it'll end immediately. Or that person will go, no, I love you. And I, I say these things not because I have it perfected because I lived my life that same exact way. Nine years until my wife went, look, the day that I want to get married on falls on a Saturday this year. We either get married now or never. And I'm like, well, I don't want to live my last of my life without her, but I do have it pretty good because, you know, I get food, I have, a, I have a house, I can do whatever I want, I have sex, probably should get married. Oh, it was something in me. My, my mom and dad, they built it in me. I loved her. My issue was my parents got divorced after 25 years, and I didn't want to do the same thing. So I went, let's just keep doing what we're doing. I owed that to her. It was my duty. That's the vow I should have taken before I ever touched her physically to commit my life to her and marry her and show her that I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. That covenant that we take as a marriage is God's covenant to us through his son. He says, I'll never leave you and I will never forsake you. But what do you have to do? Accept the blood covenant that Jesus Christ leaves. In two weeks when we get to it, that's what we'll talk about, right? When he rose up out of that grave, that covenant was secured for eternity. That's what we should be offering as men to women so that women can have that comfort. They can know that I will love them forever and I will stay with you forever. And then we have to do what? Do it, right? Remember the vows. When we took vows at our wedding, it's gonna be really bad, but we were drinking before my wedding. I was not a believer, but I was, I was getting there, right? We did some counseling, premarital counseling, and I was like, man, I kinda like this church. I kinda like this pastor. But, you know, we were, we were still living life like heathens. You know, even, if, even at the best of circumstances, I was still a heathen, you know? We were, you know, our, actually, Sheena's grandfather, man, he's, this guy was awesome. A literal genius. Like, rocket scientist kind of genius. He, he's like 85 years old, and he gets to the wedding, and he's like, hey! And he comes in, and he has a bottle of vodka. And he's like, let's have a drink and celebrate. Right, so we're you know out there back putting on our suits and we're drinking. I took my vows and I just repeated what the guy said. You know, I mean, because I'm a guy, want to do the wedding, do the ceremony, and then have sex that night. We had committed to not have sex before marriage at a certain point. She didn't got convicted on it. She's like, I don't want to get pregnant before I get married. We've been having sex for twenty some years. <laughs> it was not in the cards for us to have kids after that long. Not even a potential whoops was like, yeah, I'm probably not going to have kids, but I get it, you know? And I got saved. And I was like, one of the first things God reminded me, he's like, you took vows. I've made a vow to you in my word. You took vows too. How are you doing on yours? I'm like, oh my word. I'm really terrible, actually. And he's like, well, get to work, right? Should have, do all of that work before the blessings. And there's a blessing in doing it that way. Anyway, that was, not, that was not my point. It is not the will of God that anyone should perish, especially a child. People go, well, why do children die? It's a difficult thing. I don't have a good answer for it, apart from it is the will of God that every man is appointed a time and a date to meet the Lord. It is on God's calendar that I don't know. I don't know when that meeting will come. I don't know when it will happen. And I don't understand God's reasoning for anything when it comes to that stuff. What I do know is in God's goodness, little kids, God brings them back to heaven with him. Right? And we'll see them again. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. 
But if he will not hear you, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, that every word may be established. It's in italics. It's hinting at, it's uh, referencing the law, that two witnesses or more are what make evidence concrete. When you go to court and someone shows up and they, you know, um, I don't know, a couple beat each other up. They go to court. And the guy says, I'm innocent. I didn't do anything. And she comes in and she's like, oh, no, he beat me. It, it's obvious, right? Like if, if the cops get there, he's beating her. She's beat up. He beat her. Makes it obvious. If, say, for instance, you go to court and then you have a case where um, someone accuses somebody of stealing. You go, you, did you see him? Well, I did. I mean, yes, I saw him. Did anyone else see him? And the guy says, I wasn't even there at that moment. I have an alibi, right? And then we have all this weird, complicated stuff. But say another witness walks in, the guy's best friend. He goes, look, I, I got to tell you, I, I was his alibi. I lied. And I saw him steal it. She saw him steal it. Two witnesses. It becomes, in the judge's eyes, now more concrete that this guy's guilty. Three people see it. I mean, if three people see you stealing, what do you, do you, would you think, okay, that guy's definitely guilty? Yeah? What about four? Four witnesses for the same thing that can account the same situation down to the detail. Would you believe them? What if this guy, let's take a murder case. Case is a murder case, right? And has the death penalty attached to it. Hardest cases. Guy murders a kid. We'll use that as an example, right? Little kid gets raped and murdered. One witness saw it. Is that enough to put a guy to death? Not in a court. Most of the time, it has to be beyond the shadow of a doubt. Everyone has to be in unison on it. One is not enough. Most of the time, they would go life in prison. Because the circumstantial evidence looks like he's guilty. Two people? Uh, two people. That's Two people know. That's a little different. Three witnesses? Three witnesses um, beating this kid, and then he, you know, then he died. And the kid showed, you know, signs of being beat up. And three witnesses saw it. What about four witnesses? If you, if you, if you were sitting as a juror and you had four witnesses that said this man murdered this person, would you put him to death? Why won't you believe the gospel? Four witnesses write the same story, the same details. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Nope, it's a story. It's a farce. It's a lie. It's impossible for four people to tell the same story with the same details and it not be a lie. It's impossible or, or, to, or to, for it to be a lie. If I had two witnesses in a murder case of a child, I'd have no problem sleeping at night and putting that guy to death. Three witnesses? Absolutely four. I wouldn't even. I'd been like, well, we were done immediately. Because that guy took a life, right? He should not be living anymore. That's my thought. Just remember that. Four witnesses. Four accountings that line up exactly the same. So if someone comes and talks to you and says, hey, look, I need you to make an adjustment. I need you to do this. I saw you do that. And you go, no, I didn't. Okay, I, I saw you. I'm, I'm, I love you. I don't want you to keep doing this. I'm trying to tell you you're headed down a wrong road. I didn't do that, and I don't care what you say. Okay, it's, this is an unbiblical thing. It's going to affect others. I really need you to make an adjustment. Nope, not me. Yeah, okay, fine. And then you come to me, or Frank, or someone, right? And you go, hey, can you help me talk to this person? This is what's happened. Oh, he's like, yep, I, know, I witnessed it too. Let's go back and we'll talk. Two people now, or th three go and have a conversation. You know, like, hey, look, you, you can't be doing this. It, it's unbiblical, it's bad for you, and it leaves a bad example for kids, it leaves a bad example for people, right? We want you here, we want you into fellowship in church, but you know, you gotta make an adjustment. Nope, don't know what you're talking about, not here. What's the next step? And if he refuses to hear them all, tell it to the church. That is church rules right there, right? Go to the church. You guys, right? Might have to come and go someday. So and so is doing the following. Please pray for them. We have spoken to them m multiple times. It is, you know, I need you guys to know. And that person is not embarrassed enough to leave and they said, no, I'm still staying. But if he refuses even to hear the church, 
let him be to you like the brethren and a, tax, a heathen and a tax collector. You ask them to leave. People go, oh, I got kicked out of my church. They were so wrong. Okay, if they're biblical and they're following the biblical model, which is right here by the words of the Lord, they, they asked you to leave for a reason. When you are asked to leave, what should you be following up with? If you repent and change this, come back with us, come back into fellowship. You are like it never happened again. We forgive you, we move on. People get all mad because they got asked to leave. It. Oh, I got kicked out of the church. I, I see this a lot. I see videos online. You know, it's happened. People talk about it all the time. They kick me out of the church. I, no, they didn't kick you out of the church. You were living in sin, and they asked you to stop. And they asked you to stop again. Then group asked you to stop. And then it was mentioned to the church, and you still did it. Going around telling people that you didn't do it isn't going to change it. Assuredly, I say to you, verse 18, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. He's saying, if we do these things, right, we lovingly call people out on things like, hey, you know, it doesn't mean walk around and point out everyone else's sin constantly, right? That's not the way to handle this. We're all in different states of grace, right? God's changing us and he's molding us. And there are things that might be more inward that we need help on and we should counsel people and we should work with them and pray with them and help. But then there are going to be some things that are just so outward that you're going, man, it's dangerous for the church. It leaves a bad example. We've got to work on it. But what God says here is all that work you do, as hard as it is, as hard as it is to confront sin or as hard as it is to have conversations with people, it's worth it in the end because if you free them from that sin, man, how much better is that going to be, right? Whatever you do on earth here will be done in heaven. It's again, I say to you, if the two of you agree on earth concerning anything they ask, it will be done for you, them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name together, together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. That's why we pray together, right? Prayer meeting, pray together as a group. Wherever there are two or three more, that's where the Lord is. And the collective prayer of the church, that means something. I mean, one person praying is a huge thing. Imagine... 20 people praying or 50 people or 100 people or thousands of people praying. And Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall a brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? I love it. You know how like sometimes you ask a question and you don't really want the answer. You want them to tell you what you want the answer to be. So you offer an answer. You'd be like, how, how long should I forgive him? Seven times should be enough, right? That's, that's pretty good. I, I did that seven times. And he's like, no, 70 times seven, which is like seven, 70 to the seven to the power of seven. I don't know how you, I'm not that good at math, how you say it, 70 to the power of seven or whatever, like, which is basically like 70 times 70 times 69 times 68 times. You go through this whole a million times. You should forgive him. Constantly is what he says. Be in a constant state of forgiveness because that's what the Lord does. I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king given time, I'm not going to read through the whole thing again. We get the principle of this one though, right? I mean, this, this one's referenced a lot. This guy, master has a servant and the servant owes him a lot of money. And he says, you're going to stay in jail until you pay off that debt. And the servant begs him and says, please, I'm so sorry. I, I, I've changed. I know I, I cannot pay that debt. And he's like, okay, I'll forgive you of your debt. I'll go about your way. What's he expect him to do? probably show the same forgiveness and the same grace to someone else. Well, the servant doesn't. Say this guy owes a million dollars. The servant, he grabs by the throat and says, give me my money. He owes him like $5. And he's like, I want my money now. The people see it. They go back and tell this master. And the master's like, what are you doing? And we follow up and he says, his master in 34 was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. It's a picture of how we're to be. If we've been forgiven by God for all that we have done, what are we supposed to do? Forgive others, even the hard ones. I would tell a story about a person and forgiveness and how scared I was answering a question to that person. He happens to be sitting here today, so I won't tell the story. But it was a question that was posed and it terrified me to say because the circumstances were unbelievably terrible. 
And the question was, are you telling me I'm supposed to forgive that person? And I wanted to pee myself. Like, mm, I'm just going to, like, I got to go real quick. I won't tell the whole story. I'll just tell the, the good part of it, right? And I said, yeah, that's what I'm saying. As hard as that is, I don't even know how you'll do that. But that's what God's word says. He blessed me by coming back and saying, I'm thinking on that. Man, I wanted to punch you right in the throat. But after praying on it, getting some other counsel, you were right. I, I do. That's what God wants me to do. He wants me to forgive. I have to forgive the person that did the stuff to me. I did. I did. That's what I first came to was if God forgave me, then what am I supposed to do? God goes, I want you to forgive all the people in your life. And I went, I can't do that. I can't do that. It's like, yeah, you can. I forgave you of all that you have done. And I'll forgive you of all that you will do. And I went, you're right. It is my duty to forgive. I said, God, this life's a mess. I don't want it anymore. I'm about to end it. If you want it, you take it and you do whatever you want with it. And he said, okay, I forgive you. I cleaned you up. I'm going to turn you around. I'm going to send you out. And I went, okay. Then it is my duty to forgive. And we have to forgive. Now, I don't have a lot of time. We're at the very end, and I don't want to keep you forever. There's a big difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. Those are not the same things. And I, I, I need to say that because many people will come up, you know, we'll, we'll have conversations, or you'll walk away going, how am I supposed to forgive that person and just keep talking to them? Not what I said, actually. Forgiving them means you no longer carry a burden in your heart to want vengeance for what they did. You don't go, I want what I was owed, like this master, right? He forgave, he said, you owe me all kinds of money. I'm gonna let it go. I'm gonna let you go and let you go do your things. I will not hold you accountable for what you owe me. I forgave, I don't have conversations with the person. I, I don't need to. I'm not interested in reconciling. There's nothing I need to do. And you'll have people in your life that you'll go, God will say, you need to forgive them. That does not mean you will reconcile and have a great relationship. It's probably what God would love for you, right? To be graceful, to be merciful, to be forgiving. And if that person gets changed by that forgiveness to the point where they get saved and then you have fellowship and you grow, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven, right? It's good for the kingdom. But it does not mean just because you forgive somebody that you have to have a conversation with them. You have to reconcile. You can forgive people that have died. Stop carrying a burden for something a parent did. Why? Why carry it around anymore? Why let it kill your relationship with other people or with God or with you, right? Why drag that burden? Forgiveness is saying, I will no longer hold you to what I am owed. I don't want vengeance letting this go. Thank you for joining us today. We pray that this teaching has been a blessing to you. If you have any questions or would like to request prayer, you can visit us online at www.ccquarrance.org. If you're local, come join us for a service at 125 School Road in Charleston, Maine. We want to remind you that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. Remain armored up. And until next time, grace and peace.